Who runs this town? What does the power structure look like in this city? What is a power structure? And how do you change it? Join us now as we find out. Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. Today our topic is the power structure. There are many sources of power in civic life, and that power flows through many different kinds of conduits. You put those two together, the sources and conduits, and you get what we think of as the power structure. But the thing is, until you learn to recognize it, it remains invisible. And unless we see it, we can't possibly change the power structure. How much do people in this community really know or understand about who runs this town, about who has clout, about what those sources and conduits are in the life of Seattle. We sent our crew out onto the streets of Seattle to find out. I, I don't really know who has the power. The yeah, police have all the power in Seattle, I believe. It's the mayor and city council. Like I said, the most wealthiest people have the power. The developers ultimately, I think, hold a lot of the power. I think uh, the power is in the governor's hands right now. The one that's making changes with the bathrooms and stuff like that. That guy. Who has the power? That's the good question. Dog owners have tremendous power, I think. Honestly, I think a lot of the tech companies. The tech industry. The tech companies. They're overrunning uh, almost everything. They're completely dominating the entire society of Seattle. What we are truly world class, like best in the world is, is, is engineering. I'm not saying that there aren't some issues with the, with the technology community and some of the, the impact that that might have on some of our communities and on some people, but I think overall, it's extremely positive. I'd say the power in Seattle is with those that have the most resources. Um, so uh, those resources are, are money, also sort of the, the political clout and, and power here. Um, generally, that's centered in certain parts of the city. Well, to me, the power in the city is the system. That's what's bringing everybody down that's in poverty right now. It's the system. The prosecutors, the lawyers, the judges, we're supposed to be protected by the law. You know what I mean? But we're not safe even with them. Technology has really given everyone power. The main power rests with the media and whoever controls the media because that influences how we think. All they have to do is go on social media and they say, meet me at X Street at Y time and you have hundreds coming. Whoever's got the most money wins. And that might be the Bicycle Association. Sometimes people don't like bicyclists. Bicyclists don't respect the laws of, you know, the bike lane. Okay, I'm slow, you know. You sit on 35th and there's maybe seven bikes that go down it all day long. I'm in the way, I get that. What seven bice bicyclists voted this all in? That we were all gonna now take three times longer to get everywhere. We all want the same thing, just to get where we're going safely. I hate to say it, but money talks in the city. The larger businesses. People that have a lot of connections. I don't think anyone has it for the entire city. I think the average person, I can always speak for myself, doesn't know who has the power. Well, that's, that's the million dollar question. And I don't know what the answer is to that other than just drawing the line and saying, you know, I'm going to personally get involved in this. Uh, my boxing coach, Lee, he, he put that up there. and it, it is power over yourself, but it's also how do we do this in the collective? One thing that's really important is making sure that everybody has a seat at the table, regardless of their means, regardless of their barriers. It can be homeless people here that are articulate and know how to write, that get a group of folks together and say, hey, we all need housing. And if you get enough people to sign on board to that, you can make it happen. Have these conversations that we're having right now, you know what I mean? And not, 
be afraid to speak up, you know what I mean? We do have control, we do have circles of influence, it's just a matter of how do we use that. Well, that's where the social media comes in. He or she who barks the loudest and is best organized gets heard, and therefore change can happen. And social media really does democratize uh, your ability to do that, right? A million man march consists of a million man tripping. A, a silent man kills everyone. I don't think you can make change on your own. I think you need other people to, uh, to support you. I think people have the power in Seattle, um, and that is clear by the minimum wage movement, that people have come together and created one voice and pushed for change. As we just saw, people in Seattle experience power in widely divergent ways. And that's not a surprise. In this age of inequality, both in our city and in our country, some people are experiencing incredible opportunity and boom times, while others feel displaced and anxious about where they stand. But across the board, everybody has this heightened awareness of the power structure and the ways in which it's shifting. But heightened awareness isn't necessarily the same thing as heightened understanding. And so what I want to do today is dive a little deeper into this idea of the power structure so we can all understand it with more clarity. Now, as I said at the outset, a power structure consists of the sources of civic power plus the conduits through which it flows. And in a previous episode, I've talked about these sources. I've talked about wealth and force, state action, ideas and social norms. All of these are sources of power. But the conduits, that's something I want to talk about today and go into greater depth. There are four main conduits of power that I want to talk about, these channels through which all power is flowing. Organizations, networks, laws and rules, narratives and ideologies. Let's talk about each of these in turn here. So organizations, these are simply the building blocks of the power structure. They are the entities, the operating units of how power operates in civic life. And when you think about organizations, they can be hierarchical and top down like the Marine Corps or IBM or they can be totally decentralized, like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. They can be formal or informal, official or unofficial. But the thing is, all of them are the ways in which people structure civic action. So here in our community, you think about organizations like tech companies, Amazon. You think about advocacy groups and citizen organizations like the Cascade Bicycle Club and that lobby. You think about labor groups and workers' uh, organizations like SEIU. And then, of course, business organizations like the Chamber. All of these entities, when you put them together and think about others like them all around our community, they're probably the first thing you think of when you think about a power structure. But the second conduit that I want to talk about is networks. Networks are webs of relationships through which people organize and activate civic power. And those relationships can be based in some ways on technology. Of course, in our day, it's social media, Facebook and Twitter provide incredible networks and ways for people to direct power. But, you know, 240 years ago in this country, as this country was getting made, it was networks of people printing and sharing pamphlets. Whatever the technology may be, that power of networks to activate people who haven't been activated before is something to keep an eye on. Another way in which networks matter, of course, is not just about the technology, but it's about affinity. It's about shared identity. And so whether people are alumni of an institution together or share an ethnic or a gender identity, uh, that basis for community and network building is also very powerful. So let's think about in our, again, our community's life. Think about the incredible web of people who are alums of the University of Washington. Now, yes, there is a formal organization of alumni, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ways in which people meet at a party and they realize, oh, you went to UW, I went to UW, what year, da, 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 da. They, That set of relationships and connections. You think about the same thing with the Microsoft alumni that have shaped our community over the last generation. And then you have loosely organized entities like EPIC, which is ending the prison industrial complex, this web of young activists who are fighting for racial justice. There are plenty of other such networks in our community that don't even have the formality of logos or identities like this. They can be interest groups like real estate developers. They can be, again, ethnic networks like Asian Americans who are interested in politics. Uh, you have all these realms of people who are connecting up and flowing and directing the flow of power through these networks. The third conduit I want to talk about then is laws and rules. Now, 
These are really just the institutionalized, codified ways in which we talk about what we can and cannot do. They are the incentives and disincentives, the rewards and punishments for how we behave in public. And laws and rules in any community can be embodied, I suppose, by institutions like in Seattle, you think about the mayor, you think about the city council or an entity like the police department, and all of the ways in which these entities operate. What are the rules that they go by? What are the policies that either they create or that limit their room for maneuver? This is one of the major conduits of power in a community, and it's the one of the most contested arenas of power. And so much of our attention as citizens and when we read the news focuses on laws and rules and focuses on these people whose faces you see here. It's also worth remembering, though, that among the people who are shaping our codes and our regulations and our policies are the people behind these people who may be unelected, who may be appointed, who may be unknown to the general public. And that's as much a part of this conduit of power as these folks. The final conduit I want to talk about is narratives and ideologies. The stories we tell about who we are, the justifications and explanations for what we are as a community that both shape our frame of the possible and limit our frame of the possible. These narratives and ideologies can be both very liberating and they can be very confining, but they are all, almost always self-fulfilling. So in American life, for instance, we've always had this narrative that capitalism good, socialism bad. And that really limits what's possible in American politics for the most part. We've also had this narrative in the United States that we are a city on a hill, this blessed place that is looked upon by Providence to be exceptional in the world. And we've done a lot of good things because of this narrative, and we've done a lot of terrible things because of this narrative. Here in Seattle, in our community, we have narratives like, we're a hub of innovation. Everywhere we go, we have startups and entrepreneurs and people disrupting things. And yes, that's true, but it's only as true as we make it. And a lot of our power flows to feed the storyline. Another narrative that right now we're living very vividly with is this idea that Seattle's becoming San Francisco. Some people love this, some people hate this. But whatever you feel about it, the, con the contest over this ideology, should we be a boom town? Should we be purely a city of the future? Or should we be a place where people can live no matter what they make or whether or not they're in tech and we can sustain a sense of community? This sense of narrative and ideology is a conduit through which power is being both directed and contested. So when you think about these various conduits of civic power, organizations, you think about networks, you think about uh, laws and rules, and you think about narratives and ideologies, you put these together and you get this notion of the power structure. Now, understanding that and seeing that is one thing. Another thing that we have to begin to practice in our everyday life is simply visualizing and mapping them. What are the relationships here? How do people connect across one domain to another? And then eventually thinking a little bit more about what are the strategies that I can take as a citizen to react to this power structure? Do I want to join it? Do I want to upend and blow it up? Do I want to bypass it? Do I want to undermine it? All of these questions are questions that we have to face and choose as our community grows and evolves. And to talk about how these things unfold more deeply in our community, I want to bring into the conversation someone who's been a longtime chronicler and in many ways also a practitioner of power in Seattle. I'm delighted to have as my guest today Erica Barnett, who is the founder and editor of The C is for Crank, a great local blog here in Seattle that really is about the power structure in many ways and who runs this town. And so, Erica, welcome, first of all. Thank you. Um, I want to start with that general question, um, uh, you know, from your perspective as a journalist, as an advocate, as a citizen who's been involved in so many public issues over the years. Um, what's your take on the power structure and, and who runs this town? Well, I think it's a lot of different people. I don't think that um, that the city is, you know, is run top down by businesses, as some people suggest, you know, or big developers or, you know, the mayor's office. Um, I think it's um, it's a combination. I mean, I think. There's certainly the city power structure, um, but there's and there's certainly developers who give contributions to you know local politicians and so forth. Um, but I think one thing that's kind of unique about Seattle is um, that the neighborhoods also have a lot of power, um, and um, and that um, that is a long story that starts back in the '90s or even before. But um, but what it boils down to is that you know that 
individual neighborhood groups um, sort of structurally have a lot of power in terms of, um, of, of city decision making. And I think we've seen that recently in the debate over the mayor's housing affordability and livability agenda, which is basically a plan to densify different parts of the city, add more housing, add more affordable housing um, that has been really controversial and has gotten a lot of pushback from some of the traditional neighborhood power structure. So this HALA plan, as it's called, um, has activated a lot of these neighborhood groups. Uh, when, when you talk about neighborhood organizations, um, go one level deeper. What do you mean? Are they community councils? Are they informal kind of ad hoc networks of people who come together? Like, what, what are you talking there's, about? There's there's so many, but there's um, there's a particular structure where you have community councils, and then above that you have neighborhood district councils, mm -hmm. and I think there's um, I'm going to get the number wrong, but some somewhere north of a dozen of those. Um, and, um, and then below both of those, you have these sort of, you know, little community groups like Sustainable Ballard, say, or, you know, just or condo organizations. Um, and those all sort of filter up. But um, but so so it is kind of a ground up mm -hmm. um, process of becoming, you know, part of that larger power structure. But um, uh, but ultimately, um, there is a formal structure in place where neighborhood district councils advise the city and have some power over um, over what the city actually does. And that structure is sort of being challenged right now. Um, the neighborhood district councils were recently, as you probably heard, um, they've been- they As I had, read on the C's for Crank. That's right, yeah. <laughs> they've had some of their power removed and that the city's not gonna have a formal relationship with them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because I, there's a power dynamic between those neighborhood, traditional neighborhood groups and the people who are coming up and saying, you know, we wanna say, and that's traditionally people who haven't been included in that power structure, like Do renters. Mean, okay, renters. Yeah. Renters, immigrants, um, you know, lower income people, hmm. um, you know, who who don't, um, who maybe communicate on the internet more than they do through the physical mail um, that, you know, that informs neighbors of meetings and things like that. So so there's there's a changing dynamic there that's happening right now that I think is really exciting and really interesting to so watch. So that's fascinating. I mean, just within the air, kind of the, the set of conduits that are at the neighborhood level, you have that flux in that contest. But you were alluding earlier to, as between neighborhood groups and the city, mm -hmm. or between neighborhood groups and developers, um, another layer of contest. How has this been playing out in, in Hala, for instance, the, the power structure dynamics? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that neighborhood groups sort of feel like the um, the developers have had all this power and say in Hala because it is a density-driven plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so they're sort of doing what neighborhood groups often do, which is protesting and saying, we want things to be a different way. We don't want so much growth. We don't, we've already accepted enough growth. But what's happening, um, you know, off to the side is that you also have a lot of people saying, wait a minute, we really support HALA. And there's a coalition that's been built in support of this plan that is really unprecedented in Seattle history, where you have not just developers, the traditional supporters of development, mm -hmm. but you have renters and you have social justice groups and environmental groups all coming together. And a lot of times those folks are not all on the same page. But, but they in see this a convergence of affordability, sustainability, and, and density. Right. And so all their interests align there. Right. And, you know, and so I think, I mean, the, the most extraordinary thing was seeing groups like Puget Sound Sage mm -hmm. come on board with developers who are traditionally their enemies. Puget Sound Sage is a, a liberal social justice group. Um, but, you know, I think that through conversations with the environmentalists in the neighborhood, the, you know, sort of pro-density neighborhood people, um, they realize that in this case, their interests aligned. So one of the things we talked about earlier in our lesson was about uh, one of the conduits of power being just narrative, kind of ideology, right? Uh, and on a topic like development, one of the narratives that's out there is this narrative that sometimes gets shorthanded as NIMBY or NIMBYism, mm -hmm. right? Another narrative is much more about kind of sustainability, whatever, right? These contest stories that either uh, you're trying to tell about yourself or you're trying to put the other guy in a box with, right? Um, at this level of kind of um, narrative and ideology, um, what are the big storyline fights right now in, in, in Seattle? Well, I think that it will always be, you know, quote unquote, NIMBYs um, versus, um, you know, the people who are sort of trying to push their way in. Um, so I think that that is kind of a classic clash where you have people who are maybe single family homeowners who moved here, you know, decades ago to raise a family. But they resist and reject the label of NIMBY in the first place, right? Because it, it has such a sort of negative connotation. It has connotation. a toxic connotation. Yeah. And so... Um, 
you know, I mean, if you if you take it literally, it's just not in my backyard, right? So, I mean, that is what that is literally what they're saying, but it has a toxic connotation, and I, and I totally understand why they would reject that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, I think the narrative that the other side is sort of if they're going to be successful and they're going to push this hollow plan through. Um, and have it be mostly accepted. Um, I think the narrative that's most compelling to me is inclusion, because it's not, you know, we want to impose these, you know, boxes of ugly townhomes on you, because <laughs> nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and instead turning it into a narrative of, we want to be part of this neighborhood too, and we want to have a say, because we consider this our neighborhood too. And so yeah, as a renter, I certainly have felt that way. I've lived in Seattle for 15 years, and you know, and I stubbornly cling to the notion that I, you know, should be able to live here, and um, and despite the fact that I can't afford to buy a house, mm -hmm. and I'm very invested in my neighborhood. Well, last question I want to pose to you um, in the brief time we have left is just about your role. Um, first of all, are you part of the power structure as a journalist, as a blogger, and um, and if so, how does that manifest itself? Well, I think um, I think by virtue of the fact that I've been around for a little while now, um, I I am part of that power structure. Um, but I would say that as a small blogger, it's uh, you know I'm a very small and shrinking part of that in a way. I mean, sadly, you know the media since I've been here has really contracted, and um, and I think proportionally the power that small bloggers like myself and like Publicola and like, you know, maybe Crosscut and other people, you know, sort of at my, at the level that I'm at online um, are a shrinking proportion of the power and more of the uh, media's power is being concentrated in the hands of the Seattle Times. You know, we haven't had the PI for, for the most part for, for several years now. Um, and um, and so I think that they have an outsized influence on um, on decision makers. I mean, you see this in there was a column by Danny Westneat that um, freaked everybody out a while back about they're going to take all your single family zoning and houses away, and that in, ended up influencing city policy in a really concrete way and very quickly. So um, so the media structure continues to shift, and um, and I think I think it will continue to do so. Well, it's part and parcel of the larger dynamic in in this town and in this country right now, where a lot of power is concentrating into uh, fewer hands, and uh, the work of bloggers and activists and others uh, is about really trying to circulate and disperse that uh, in new ways that uh, uh, either change the power structure or bust out of it uh, in different ways. So, Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Erica Barnett's website is called theseasforcrank.com. Correct. Dot com. Uh, a wonderful blog about power in the city, about contests, not only over housing and affordability, but all manner of public issues. Uh, and Erica, thanks so much for this conversation. Thank you, Eric. So we just heard from Erica Barnett about the power structure and how it plays out on a single issue like housing affordability. But whatever issue you're concerned about, it could be economic opportunity, crime, education, these same conduits come into play. Organizations, networks, laws and rules, narratives and ideologies. Looking for these, thinking about how these relate to one another, and seeing the ways in which they form a lattice work, a power structure together, that by influencing one another and by having relationships move across each of these conduits, this is the way we begin to see differently the nature of power in any community. There's actually a great website that illuminates some of this. It's called littlesis.org. And it's Little Sis being the opposite of Big Brother. And the idea of LittleSis.org is it provides all of this data and visualizations and resources to map power structures, both at local levels and nationally. And you can go to that website, but just think in these terms about how these connections play out and how the connections are gonna be different from issue to issue, neighborhood to neighborhood, region to region. Thinking in systems, thinking in these ways, and being able to see these maps of power is just elemental if we want to be able to change the power structure. Well, every episode we take questions on social media, and one of the things that uh, I love doing is hearing these questions, because as Steven Eislin asks us on Twitter, sometimes they're pretty big questions like this. How important is the role of vision for cities? How can we guide citizens to think big and restore their confidence in tomorrow? You know, on one level, that's a question about leadership. We need leaders, whether they are elected or not, who can articulate a vision that we can all get behind or feel that we're part of. But frankly, because of the nature of this show and just our work, 
We believe that this is more of a bottom-up question. It's about us, the citizens, generating vision together. And we've got to get out of the habit of just being spectators to other people's vision and learning how to come together in small groups at the level of the neighborhood or the community or our interest group. Small groups where we talk about what does it look like to have a vision together? What is our vision for a more inclusive Seattle? What is our vision for a more inclusive society? What kind of place do we want to be when we grow up? And those conversations, cell by cell, circle by circle, will add up and roll up to a bigger sense of vision that our leaders can ultimately follow. Our second question on social media comes in on Facebook from Rebecca Lane, and it's another great one. What are the current shifts in power that you're seeing due to gender politics? You know, on one level in our society right now, this is a time of incredible opportunity for women. In politics, in business, in all different domains, women are in greater positions of voice and visibility and power. At the same time, there's been a lot of emphasis lately about how women have to lean in and how there's a lot of burden on individual women to speak up more for themselves, to be more vocal. And I'm all for that as far as it goes. Women should be greater advocates for themselves as individuals. But the thing about lean in is that sometimes it can obscure the larger structural dimension of power. And our whole topic today of power structures comes right into play. As much as you might lean in as a woman, the reality is still that organizations, networks, laws and rules, and narratives and ideologies might still be stacked against you. That whole latticework and array of power might still bend toward preserving the privilege of men. And so for all of us, whether we are men or women, we've got to take a closer look at the power structures and the ways in which these conduits still preserve privilege for men. And until we can get around that fact and change that structure, we won't truly have gender equality in politics or civic life. Well, we love hearing these questions from our viewers, and we want to encourage you to communicate with us in every channel you can. You can get us on Twitter at our hashtag, CitizenUTV, uh, or at our handle, at Seattle Channel, or just send us a simple old-fashioned email at contact at seattlechannel.org. We love to hear from you. This episode has been focused so much on the question of power structures, and I know some of it has been about maps and concepts and these big ideas, but I just want to close by bringing it back home. Think about where you live. Think about who runs not just your town, but your neighborhood, who has say. Think about seeing in systems and learning to map things this way. Every one of us has a responsibility to develop this site and then to share what we see with others. And when we do that together, we can change not only the power structure, but the very practice of power in our city and in our country. That's it for this episode of Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu, and thank you so much for watching.